Close your eyes for a moment and imagine. There is a little creature in front of you. A pet of some kind. Can be anything you want. It is completely focused on you. It wants your attention. It responds to your voice. It is excited you are together. It's cute, right? Let's say you call him Lucky. Now Lucky wants nothing more than to be your friend, and as time passes you might start getting attached to the little guy. You keep him clean and feed him when he's hungry. You might even come to love him, and soon a life without Lucky becomes harder and harder to fathom. Now imagine Lucky is a robotic artificial intelligence system. This kind of future relationship with robots or AI, or however you want to call them, is not too big of a leap. Developments in artificial intelligence systems has been met with great enthusiasm from customers and investors alike. It has been met with fear and apprehension too, with stories of post-apocalyptic, futuristic, end-of-the-world situations where our own creations come back to destroy us. So how do we begin to talk about this phenomenon properly? It is an extremely broad and complex field and would take hours to cover. Even the word AI is understandably met with some skepticism. So rather than looking into the entire field of AI, this video will focus on human reactions to it, specifically in terms of empathy. Admittedly, this is still a bit broad, but let me start with an example. I was at the Venice Biennale this summer with a good friend. After many hours of art overload and sun and lively conversation, we arrived in a large room showcasing a general collection of works from around the world. The biggest and obviously most central aspect of the room was a machine built by San Yuan and Peng Yu and titled Can't Help Myself. What you see is a large robotic arm moving, swaying, and sweeping some kind of red viscous liquid from the ground. It does all sorts of random movements, and its only task is to clean that redness that has coagulated around it. You quickly realize that the robot's task is not accomplishable, and the thick, blood-like muck at its base will never be cleared by the robot's actions. Looking... it's not pleasant, is it? At least, that's how most people seem to react when looking at it. I later interviewed my friend to ask for her initial response. Just the way the machine moves makes it seem... it's very animalistic, and I don't know if it was just automatic, then you would just understand it as a machine, but even seeing a, a, a video and like a screen and you don't have like the spatial understanding of the work, it still, it still disturbs me. Yeah. And it's a good story for it. What? Somehow, this caged machine elicited, at least from the two of us, an emotional and somewhat disturbed response. But then the question I ask is why? Somehow, this machine that feels nothing, doesn't interact with the world outside its box, made us feel terribly sorry for it. Interestingly enough, this machine is classified as an AI. It scans its surroundings for the liquid in real time, and decides on its own what sequence of movements it will use to complete its task. Now, AI is a bit of a hyped up term nowadays, and has the tendency to be overused. So for the purposes of this video, I will be using Merriam-Webster's very simple definition, where AI is simply the capability of a machine to imitate intelligent human behavior. This imitation characteristic leads to fascinating new consequences in how human beings relate to new technologies. So let's leave the robot arm for a bit and talk about the most obvious link between humans, robot AI systems, and the role of empathy. I'm talking about the plethora of companion technology. 
These include systems like Siri or Alexa that act as companions of knowledge, answer your questions, but also laugh and joke if you make the right kind of interactions. Newer technologies are taking this idea of companionship even further. Take, for example, this anime hologram alarm clock. <laughs> or, if you prefer, this whatever this is. Aufgepasst. Behold the height of luxury from the sexy minds at Tip Corp von Dubot. Robots like these, though perhaps less so that last one, interact with the user in a seemingly real and even human way. It taps directly and purposely into that human empathetic response we've been talking about. This is something you might call an AE device, artificial empathy, as opposed to AI, since AE devices are about pre-written reactions and do not think in real time, as AI devices claim to. But yet other devices, regardless of their status as AE or AI, have moved people in even more historical ways. Take, for example, the Mars rover Opportunity. When it died, an entire community of people online mourned for this little robot. Partly because when NASA released its last communication, it said, My battery is low and it's getting dark. Many have called it a deeply heartbreaking message. And despite this robot not being alive or even remotely conscious, we somehow as a community projected our own thoughts and fears upon it. We imagined it must have been scared or felt alone. Now, the study of human relations towards AI or robots or AE devices is already well underway, beginning notably with a device many of you may be familiar with. The Tamagotchi. For those of you who do not know, the Tamagotchi was a craze in the 90s and early 2000s, selling millions worldwide. It is a type of digital play companion that requires constant care and attention. It'll need feeding and grooming, and will die in only half a day if you ignore it. It was an unprecedented way in which new technological devices interacted with their users. The Tamagotchi was such a famous phenomenon, in fact, that anything talking about emotional or empathetic relationships with digital devices that utilize AE can fall under the term Tamagotchi effect. The Tamagotchi effect was, and still is in many ways, controversial. By using cute imagery, voice tones, catchphrases, or movements, different devices tap into human empathetic responses. Some have encouraged this development, saying it promotes the building of relationships and understanding of social cues for young children. While others argue, that this is nothing more than an exploitation of human emotion in order to manipulate the user and elevate profit. Either way, our brains are somehow stimulated to see the object other than what it is. So how does this work for our initial example, the robotic arm? While other AE devices seem to have obvious methods for imitating human or living behavior, this robot has little to none. No cutesy voices, no human characteristics. It doesn't speak, it doesn't die, it doesn't interact with you. Perhaps we treat the robot as alive because to a certain extent it is. Not in a literal sense, of course, but technically it uses energy. It takes up space, it accomplishes a task. The main thing a robot is lacking is a sense of free will, an ability to act without the need for a programmer, to help itself, if you will. Perhaps it is precisely this that makes the robot so tragic in nature. In the marrying of AI programs with physical bodies that move so easily and so realistically, in a way, 
it's possible that we already realize to some extent that the robot has come to life. Again, not literally, but perhaps in our communal imagined perceptions of them. Well, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I may be reading way too far into this whole robot tragedy thing, but if you have any thoughts on this of your own, please shoot me a message. I would love to hear from you. Leave me a comment, anything you want. <laughs> um, and have a lovely rest of your day.